today I, I continue in our message series, message two of the mystery of marriage. How many enjoyed last week? Pastor Richard laid it down. Someone even told me, said, Pastor Richard got a hold of us last weekend. I said, well, you needed it. Now, uh, that was some truth, and uh, we're changed, transformed by truth. So thank you, Pastor Richard, for giving us the truth. If you will, go ahead and open up your Bible to Ephesians chapter 5. If you don't have a Bible with you, that's quite all right today. Don't ever let it happen again, but we'll have the scripture on screen for you. But uh, we're going to jump. I tell you what, let, let me pray. Let me pray real quick. And just, you know, the Super Bowl's just got me all messed up. I'm just kidding. I could care less. All right. I'm going to watch it, but I don't care who wins. Lord, I thank you that uh, there's something far more exciting happening and taking place and being built beyond a Super Bowl. Lord, I thank you for. This life we live and the, the different moments we get to enjoy, like football games. But, Lord, I thank you that you're building your church and the gates of hell will not prevail against her. And I thank you that we get to be a part of that church. And, Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you that your word is truth. Your truth gives life. Your truth transforms. And, Lord, that is what I'm asking today, God, that as I speak... Lord, that I would simply be a vessel that you speak through. Lord, I pray that I can get out of the way. I pray that I do not taint the word, that uh, you would speak through me. And Lord, that you, Lord, would uh, cause your word to be planted in every single heart, every single hearer today. And Lord, I pray that that word would take root and give life. Thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do in our midst, what you've already done. Lord, we're full of expectation. And Lord, we come this morning realizing, God, that we're meeting with the God of the universe. Holy Spirit, we ask you to teach us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Achieving a healthy marriage is a process. Can you say that? Process. Process. Marriage is first the choice and then the daily willingness of two people becoming one and then thereafter the choice to remain one and that's a process sometimes it's an exciting and wonderful process other times it's a very hard and challenging process sometimes that process is even painful and confusing but if we choose the will of God concerning marriage and we put on Christ, and we take off self, we can come to a place in our marriage that is very rewarding and very fruitful. And that's the promise of God. Amen? Great marriages are built. You don't say, I do, and then you have. Can I get a witness? We have to build a marriage with intentionality, with focus, with diligence with perseverance it requires continual learning and continual fervent love marriages prosper when we seek to know God's way and then we choose to do marriage God's way according to his word aren't you grateful for God's word that uh, the Lord didn't just give us a goal and say figure it out he gives us a goal and then he says here here's my word Honor this, do this. None of us naturally are born knowing how to do marriage. They don't even teach it in school. They teach stuff that you never use, like geometry and algebra. But they don't teach the stuff that, that we really need to know about. They don't teach marriage. As a matter of fact, you're not even born again <laughs> knowing how to do marriage, right? Right? God's Spirit comes into you. The same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, and you still don't know how to do marriage completely and perfectly, right? God's way of doing marriage has to be discovered. It has to be learned. And then it has to be chosen and applied. 
to all of our single adults and our young single adults, unless you know that you are called by God to live a life of singleness and celibacy, you are called to marriage. And I want to encourage you through this series to learn and take notes so that you will live equipped and so that you don't have to make the same mistakes of others. You know, it is possible to avoid mistakes, right? If you'll receive teaching and apply that teaching, that's called wisdom. Knowledge is just what I know, but applied knowledge is wisdom. And if you'll apply that wisdom, you can avoid a lot of mistakes. It doesn't mean you're going to have a perfect marriage, but you can definitely avoid a lot of the pains and mistakes that others have. If you're single, I want to encourage you because I think that, that the enemy is so uh, vicious that he loves to take any state, whether we're single or married, and make us feel like we are less than or that we are missing something. And if you're single today, I, I want to encourage you to stop seeing yourself as less than. You are not without something. You are within something. You are within a time of preparation. And you need to see that time as a blessing and as a gift of God. And you need to use that time as an opportunity to be made whole, to have your mind renewed and your heart transformed so that you step into a marriage not broken because that's what breaks a marriage. Marriage is beautiful. It's God's idea. And what breaks a marriage is one, when one or two or more people choose to remain broken. And so use that time to be made whole and, and get ready. Get ready for marriage. Not the wedding. That'll come, but get ready for the marriage. If you're married throughout this series, you may, in fact, be faced with how far from God's plan for marriage that you really are. And the enemy of your soul would love to take advantage of that thought and condemn you. The worst thing that you can do is welcome condemnation. The second worst thing that you can do is tell yourself that your marriage is too far gone. That's what's called hopelessness. And God is a God of hope. He cannot give hopelessness. So you're in the house of God, in the presence of the Lord, among God's people, hearing the word of God. There should be no welcome of the feeling of hopelessness. You need to receive hope today. It doesn't matter how bad it is, God can change. God can restore. He can redeem. As a matter of fact, He can resurrect. He can take what is dead and lifeless and bring new life again. I want to say this, that God never reveals a problem to leave you in it. God never reveals a problem. He never brings conviction. He never brings enlightenment. He never causes you to go, you know what, I didn't know that, and then just leave you there. God always reveals a problem to bring you out of it. He's a good God. He's merciful. He's full of grace. God always reveals where you are not so that he can take you where he wants you to be. God reveals problems to awaken a cry in us. God always reveals what we lack to awaken within us a cry for what he has. That's why he reveals that to us. And it's not to condemn us, it's to compel us. To cry out to God and say, God, I need you. Go to the book of Psalm and, and you find a, a man, David, who constantly was confessing to God what he didn't have, but also professing to God what God had and what he needed. Over and over and over. I'm grateful for David. I'm, I'm glad that God saw fit to put the cry of David's heart throughout Scripture. And he would cry out and say, God, I don't have what it takes to do what you've called me to do. But you have it. And so, Lord, please give it. And I'm ready to receive it. One of the prayers that David prayed so often 
was not just God help me, but God teach me. Because David understood that I'm in a place that I'm in, and, and it's not God's fault, it's, it's my fault. And I realize that I've arrived here because of what I don't know. So God, teach me. Teach me your ways, and then give me the grace to walk in them. Wonderful prayer. And I want to encourage you that as we go through this series, if the Lord reveals to you that your marriage is in a place of need, then don't run and, and, and feel condemned. Run to God and say, God, I hear you talking. And so, Lord, teach me. Remain teachable. Amen? Marriage is a setup for dependency on God's grace. God's asked us to enter into something that without him we cannot do. We will mess it up. We will break marriage if we do not have the author of marriage at the central focus of our affection and our attention. Amen? The power of marriage is in knowing and then never losing sight of the purpose of marriage. The purpose of something is the goal of something. It indicates the target. What is the target of marriage? Is it just so we can have children? I mean, you know, is it... What is the purpose of marriage? Why does God call two people to become one? How can you hit the target if you don't know what the target is? If you don't know the goal of marriage, how do you know if you're winning at marriage? No one marries with the plan to divorce. You never find anyone on their wedding day even thinking about divorce. It's the furthest thing from their mind. As a matter of fact, if you were to ask, him, ask them, you know, when do you guys plan to get married? They look at you, what? That's not even a thought. It's not even a desire we have no plans to get divorced. They didn't plan to end up, the, end up there, but, but here's the mistake. They didn't have a plan. They did not devise a plan to avoid divorce. They did not put in place what is necessary to recognize dissension and distance and division. God's plan for marriage is a winning plan, and it will require both the husband and the wife knowing that plan and then both of them embracing that plan and working diligently and faithfully to execute God's plan if we want to experience the rewards of marriage. So if marriage is God's idea, what was his intention or the goal or the desire in creating marriage? Again, God is the author of marriage. Why did he create this? Well, Ephesians chapter 5 tells us for this reason what reason for the reason and purpose of marriage for the reason of marriage man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two oftentimes very opposite very different the two will actually become that word become is a process they will become what one they will become one they will be one flesh and then he goes on to say Paul says this is a great mystery this is a great mystery marriage reveals a great mystery what is the mystery and then he tells you but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Well, wait a minute, Paul. I thought you were just talking about marriage. And Paul would say to you, I am. But ultimately, I'm talking about Christ and the church. Paul calls marriage a mystery, and it's a mystery because marriage, the marriage between man and woman, is designed to reveal something to the world, and it is Christ's love for his church. And if you're looking for one sentence or a blanket statement on God's purpose for marriage and why God created it, it would be this. God created marriage to reveal to the world how much Jesus loves 
his future bride, the church. Now, real quickly, there's something beautiful in, in, uh, among the Hebrew and the Jewish life, and it's called betrothment. In other words, they, they actually act like they enter into a covenant. They, they act like they're married before they're married, apart from the uh, consummation of the marriage. But the commitment is there, the loyalty there, the affection, the, 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 the love is there. And so while we are not yet married to Christ as the church, we are betrothed to him. And he's loving us. And so Paul is saying that, that God created marriage. Ultimately, there are many reasons, many purposes under this ultimate umbrella, this ultimate purpose. And we'll get to that in a second. But ultimately, God created marriage to show the world how much Jesus loves people. I don't know about you, but that's a little convicting. Would anybody agree? Wait a minute. God wants to use my marriage to show the world how much he loves the world? No one else convicted? And while that statement is very true, it doesn't explain the relational needs of man. Okay, it, 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 it doesn't talk about God's desire to meet relational needs of men and women through marriage. Now, it implies it, but it does not explain it. And the word is guilty of that a lot of times. It doesn't take time to explain. It implies. Why? Anybody ever been told, hey, I got something for you? Can't tell you what it is right now. And then all you do for the next whatever length of time is think about, what is it? What is it? What is it? I got to know. I got to know. And if you're a child and it's right before Christmas and your parents hide the presents in the closet, what do you do? You start seeking. And that's exactly why Scripture oftentimes implies something but does not explain it. To awaken a seek in you. To awaken a desire, a hunt in you. I got to know what it is. I got to know. Wait a minute, God. I, I heard you say something, but you didn't explain it. You implied it. And God's like, that's right. You got to come close to me to find out what I'm trying to say. And so that's what he's doing here. He doesn't explain it, but he implies it. So we have to consider the whole counsel of God's word. We don't just take Ephesians 5 and say, okay, that's it. We have to take the whole counsel of God's word. And God has a lot to say about marriage. Starting from Genesis chapter 1 all the way to Revelation where there's this huge wedding. This marriage supper of the Lamb, right? This marriage where Jesus, it becomes one with his church united for eternity. Starts with marriage and doesn't really end. But the, what we know of the world ends with marriage. So God's pretty focused on this thing called marriage. The purpose of marriage is multifaceted because marriage accomplishes so much and provides so much for us spiritually, relationally, naturally, and even practically. Marriage meets many needs and desires of the human heart. Marriage allows for many pleasures, benefits, and blessings in this life. Can we say this? Marriage is rich with purpose. And I say that today, and you may be thinking, not mine. Not mine. I, I, really, don't, I really don't see any riches. I, I, see, I see frustration, and I see disappointment, and I see heartache and I see pain and that may be your reality but it can be your past it does not have to be your future and I don't want to make light of what you have experienced but I do want to elevate what God can do I want to elevate what God can do and you don't just have to give him a chance you have to give him your heart okay you have to say, God, here am I. Change me. Amen? 
One of the biggest or greatest reasons for marriage, purposes of marriage, is that marriage satisfies the longing of every person's heart for intimate companionship. And it removes us from the place of aloneness. Aloneness. Not loneliness. Loneliness is a feeling. You can be in a room full of people and still feel lonely. That's a different subject. That's a different focus. We're not talking about loneliness. We're talking about aloneness. Aloneness is a reality. It's a state. And so the Lord created marriage to, to take me out of aloneness. It's not good for man to be what? Alone. This was God's... What he, when he looked upon man and, and, and called everything that he had created good, and he comes to this reality that, wait a minute, there's something not right here. He said, man is alone. It's not good for man to be alone, so he created for him a helpmeet, a partner. It's not good for man to be alone, so God made for one another a mate. Marriage blesses men and women with partnership with friendship, with companionship. And that companionship can grow to be this wonderful union where two people have one another to comfort one another through the sorrows of life and then magnify its joys. Marriage is a gift to mankind because Scripture says two are better than one, right? Two are better than one. If one falls, the other can lift him up or her up. And Satan knows this truth. Satan knows this truth, and that's why he fights against your marriage so intensely and intently. This is why he works so hard to create dissension and division in your marriage. That's why he works so hard to keep you at odds. And he'll even use your children to do it. He'll use finances to do it. He'll use sickness to do it. He'll use misunderstanding to do it. He'll use your communication to do it. He'll use your mistakes to do it. He's cunning. And he's looking for every opportunity to thwart the plan of God. Often companionship, friendship, partnership is what is weak and often missing in many marriages because fighting with one another is the choice over fighting for one another. Many aren't experiencing friendship and true togetherness in marriage because they simply do not know how to be a friend. You know that's possible? You can want friendship but really not know how to be a friend. And that reality is true within some marriages. We live very independent of others. You say, that's just my personality. I get it. But that's why God makes you a new creation. That may be who you have been, but it, it can't be who you're going to be. And so God changes you. Are you a good friend to your spouse? Well, I'm more of the romantic kind. Okay. Okay. Slick daddy, that's, that's all right. It's all right. You can be romantic, but are you a good friend? Just are you a good friend? Or let me ask it another way: Is your friendship, is your companionship, compelling? Is it attractive? Proverbs eighteen twenty four says that one who has friends must himself. And the implied instruction here is if you want friends, you've got to first be friendly. Do you know what it means to be a friend? Have you taken a season to understand and study friendship? Have you ever just studied friendship in Scripture? Have you ever just studied what it looks like? To, Proverbs is full of instruction on what it means to be a friend. And then if you get a good old Strong's Concordance, you can look up the different 
definitions of love and there is a version of love called friendship love and if you'll study scripture everywhere that word appears you'll begin to learn God's design for friendship and what it looks like to be a faithful friend Jesus is a faithful friend he's our Lord but he's our brother that stick, he's our friend that sticks closer than a brother We can learn a lot from Jesus if we'll just hang out with him. Right? Can you list the virtues and the qualities of a friend? One easy place to start is just start listing what it is you would love to have in a friend. And then just simply ask yourself, am I this? Some marriages today would radically improve and strengthen if being a faithful friend just became the priority there might be other things that need to be focused on but if if just learning to be a friend became the focus for this reason both man and woman will leave their mother and father and they will be joined together in friendship marriage meets the longing of every person's heart to no longer be alone and enjoy intimate companionship. Paul tells us in Ephesians 5 that marriage is a mystery, not because it's hard to figure out. It's not like God's keeping from us or keeping a secret. God doesn't keep secrets. He holds mysteries. He's not a secret-keeping God. He withholds knowledge so that, again, you will seek to know. And then he responds to that pursuit by letting us know and so marriage is a mystery and it will remain a mystery until we seek him to know all that he wants us to know concerning marriage marriage when done God's way reveals to man how much Jesus loves his bride his church which brings us to our second I only have two points today it's a two point message no poem for those of you that know that little whatever saying. Number two, marriage positions you to reveal and demonstrate to your spouse Jesus' amazing on a continual basis. Most of us got married to be loved. But marriage is in fact, first and foremost, about giving love. You say, well, what about me getting loved and being loved? Well, there's a wonderful principle in Scripture in the kingdom called sowing and reaping. And if you sow love, guess what you get? Oh, that's an easy one right there. That's, that's, that's low-hanging fruit. If you sow love, if you plant corn seed, what do you get? You guys are smart. Okay, if you plant love seed, what do you get? There you go. If you plant love, if you sow love, you get love. If you want a winning marriage, your focus must change from being loved to a greater focus on giving love. I think one of the ploys of the enemy is to keep us in a constant state of wanting rather than where the Lord wants to take us, and that's in a constant place of giving. And if we live in our marriage always focused on what I want or what I need, then it's going to be rough. But if you'll let the Lord position you, wait a minute, I, I'm called to give. I'm called to give. I'm called to be the giver. If you want to win at marriage, the prevailing question in our marriage must be, am I demonstrating Jesus's amazing love to my spouse today Paul gives us some powerful marriage advice at the beginning of Ephesians chapter 5 Ephesians by the way is a wonderful book all of them are awesome Ephesians chapter 5 just a lot of truth and he says this this is heavy this is heavy imitate God what 
Paul, you are setting the bar a little too high, son. That's what he says. He says, imitate God. Act like God. Imitate God in everything you do because you are his dear children. And there, watch this, verse 2. In marriage, live a life filled with love. Following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice. Again, the implied truth here is that he loved us before we ever loved him. He loved us even when we were not loving him. He still loved us. He didn't wait until we loved him and then he said, okay, now you get it. I'll start loving you. No, he loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for, uh, for us as a pleasing aroma to God. In other words, his willingness to love us was rooted in his love for the Father. Why would he love us? Why would he love me? I think about that often. Jesus, why would you love me? I've got all kinds of reasons for you not to love me. In Scripture, Jesus would in turn say, it's because I love the Father that I love you. And so if you're wanting motivation, why should I love my spouse? After all he's done or after all she's done, maybe the Lord's calling you to get your eyes off of him or her as your motivation, as your reasoning, and look to the Father. Amen? Many are experiencing tension and strife in your marriage because you want love more than you want to give love. Not realizing that that choice to love would soon awaken love in your spouse. Too often we refuse to give, or excuse me, we, we want what we refuse to give, and that's not the way that Jesus loves, right? Right? And Paul just told us, I want you to love like Jesus loves you. I want you to love others like Jesus loves you. 1 John, the Apostle John says, Let us not love with just words or speech, but actually let us love with actions and in truth. What actions would, would say that you speak love I realize that's a loaded question and if we were begin to list all the actions that we could take that would communicate love we would be here for hours I realize that so to save time Jesus says this here I'll, I'll tell you what what love in action looks like he says this as I've loved you that's how I want you to love others so with just, just, just with one person and one name, he defines for us what loving other people looks like. I want you to love them like I love you. Which brings us to another problem. If you've not encountered the love of God, you're going to struggle to love your spouse. Jesus sets the bar for love and he says, you want to know what this kind of love looks like? Just look at me. Do to others and for others exactly as I have done and will continue to do for you. Another harsh reality is that we've not studied the heart of our spouse long enough. Maybe in the beginning it was physical attraction that brought you together. There's nothing wrong with that. Okay, I hope you find your spouse attractive and that it goes beyond just mere beauty because scripture says beauty is fleeting. We lose hair, right? I used, oh, I used to have a head of hair. It was curly. I had a mullet. Don't be laughing. 
That's when mullets were cool. Y'all remember those days? Those were good old days. We haven't taken time to study our spouse, his or her needs, their personality, their makeup, their design, their deficiencies, their strengths, their fears, their des desires, and the list goes on and on, to even know how to love them or really where to begin to love them. Oftentimes, we are demonstrating to our spouse a certain kind of love or we're loving our spouse the way we want to be loved. Right? And that may not be their love language. So often we're guilty of that. Do you know your spouse's love language? Do you know what it is that you could do regularly that would cause him or her to know without a doubt that you love them? Can I give you a resource? And we're almost finished. Here's a website that you can go to. And of course, there are all kinds of resources. But if you'll just go to this website first, and it's this, the five love languages. Tons of resources. And there's the website up at top. You can actually take a, a free test to find out what your primary love languages are. You can do that today, and it's free. Don't even have to pay anything. The five, uh, five love languages are words of affirmation, acts of service, and if you're a quiet person, and your spouse's love language is words of affirmation, they're probably starving. Acts of service. Receiving gifts, quality time, physical touch. Now the reality is all of those are needed in a relationship but, or in a marriage. But, but the thing is we all have primary, we all have our, our first love language. And so praise God, God's raised up. Gary Smalley, you know, I, I believe that, that, that this teaching came by way of revelation, honestly, because it's been used to save a lot of marriages and prepare a lot of people for marriage. They've got a five love languages test for single adults who plan to be married one day. Really, really wonderful instruction. So the question that you have to begin to answer in your marriage isn't, am I being loved, but am I revealing Christ's love in the way that I love and live with my spouse? Mike, you can come this morning. I alluded to it just a few seconds ago, but I want to I close with this, and that is this. Marriage becomes hard and hurtful when I choose to try to love my spouse, and many of us live with great intentions. Marriage becomes hard and it becomes hurtful when I try to live with or love my spouse in when I'm doing life apart from the love of God. And we live in such an age where our busyness and the distractions, and I'll even say the, 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 the failure of the church to teach people to commune with God so that daily we are refreshed and renewed by the love of God, that most of us get up and go through our day, leave our house, come back to our home empty of the love of God. And you can't give what you don't have. And so we want to be loved. And in our heads, we know I should love, but I ain't got none to give. Why is that? Because most of us, and I hate saying that word most, but most of us do life at a distance. 
from the love of God. At very best, it's a head knowledge and not a daily experience. We know God loves us. That's what they taught us to sing in Sunday school, right? But most of us go through our day feeling void of the love of God. As a matter of fact, Satan uses that distance to make us feel not just empty of love, but some of us feel like God is disgusted with us. Right? You don't have to say yes, because I'm human just like you, and I have the same enemy, so I know what he does. And I know that some of you here today, he's pounded you and beat you up with that lie. And it's nothing more than a lie. If you knew how much God loves you, He doesn't just love you because He has to. You're a focus of His. You say, well, there's 7 billion people. How does God? He's God. He can do it. He's thinking about you. You know, the longing of His heart is not that you would just, just get it right. Start doing No, no, no. The thing He thinks about the most is you and Him you experiencing his great love for you that's what he thinks about I want to leave us with this admonishment we have to stop trying to accomplish something with nothing I think the fact that we're Americans hurts us we're so independent you know we just have this song I think I can I think I can I think I can I think I can and then we don't and then we live with the, 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 the shame and the regret and the disappointment because we can't, even though we sung the song, we can. And most of us, all of us, entered into marriage thinking, man, this is going to be good. This is go I'm going to be good. I'm going to be the best spouse there has ever been. And then a month into it, you're like, whoa. I got problems. But if we'll lean in and experience the author of love, the author of marriage, things will begin to shift and change in our life. I, I want to close today. I, I want to actually hijack Paul's prayer for the church in the book of Ephesians. And I know that we've just spent, I don't know how long we talked. We've, we've been talking about marriage and we've been talking about the love between man and woman. But actually, I want to close today and I don't necessarily want to pray for your marriage, although that is important and through this series there'll be moments to do that. I actually want to pray for this. I want to pray over us today that you would encounter, that you would experience the width the length, the height, the depth of God's love. And if you'll experience that, if we will experience the love of God, which is eternal and vast, there is no end to His love. You'll never come to the end of God's love. You know what eternity will be? Eternity will be forever coming to the knowledge of God's love. And just when you've been there 10,000 years and you think you're coming to the end of God's capacity, ability, and the, the, the greatness and splendor of His love, He'll say, no, i got another million years for you. And even our brains are thinking, how is that possible? Don't think about it too long. You can't. So that's what I want to pray for today as you stand if you'll stand and just bow your heads I want to pray over you this morning and Pastor Don if you want to come I know that some of us were raised in traditions where raising our hands may not have been practiced I understand that scripture encourages us often to lift up our hands and sometimes we, we need to be uncomfortable to be comforted so 
I just want to encourage you, lift your hands. Now, to what degree, that's your choice. If you want to go all out, that's great. And all that is, is just telling God, God, I don't have what it takes sometimes. All that is, it's beautiful to God. All it is is saying, God, I, I need you. God, I surrender. God, I give up. God, I don't lean to my own understanding. It's, it's like my little nephews right now. When they want to be held, the first thing they do is lift up their hands. And you know, it's it, it, it touches my heart. It, it's no burden for me to reach down and lift them up. I love to do it. And the Lord's right here, right now, ready to lift you up. God's not repulsed by your weakness. God's not disgusted with your inability. The love of God is moved by your inability, but He doesn't want you to stay there. So, Father, I pray over us today. I pray over your people, your church, your children. Lord, that you would cause Christ to dwell in our hearts. That our hearts would not be void of Christ, but our hearts would be full of Christ. And, Lord, you know what needs to happen to create that space. You know what needs to be driven out so that you can dwell there. Lord, we're asking you to dwell richly within our hearts. Can you say amen to that? Lord, dwell in our hearts richly. And I pray over us that you would anchor and you would root our heart in love. Not in shame, not in regret, not in failure, not in fear, but you would root our hearts in love. Cause us to comprehend what is the width and the depth and the, the height and, and, and the length of your love. Cause us to experience that. Cause us to know that. Scripture says, enlighten us. Open the eyes of our heart. Open the eyes of our understanding. Cause us to truly know and experience the love of Christ that passes human knowledge and fill us with the fullness of God. God, nothing is too difficult for you. Give us each faith to believe that you can do exceedingly, abundantly, beyond all that we could think or imagine. Fill us with hope. Fill us with vision. Fill us with faith for what you can do in us and through us and in our marriage. And if you agree with that, can you just declare amen? Amen. Come on, let it be hearty. Amen. Amen.